Thank you for coming. Thank you for singing. And just before we read from the word of God, we're going to take time to pray. <coughs> Our Father, we've been singing of eternity. We think of those wonderful words that we did sing, but Jesus died. We're thankful that we have heard, we can look into the scriptures, and we can find that there is one who not only has died, but one who has died for the ungodly. One who has gone out of his way, has left the glories of heaven to die for others. What a man that he is. We're thankful that he is exalted at thy right hand. We're thankful that there's a time coming when all of the world, all creation will worship him. He is worthy. We're thankful we have the opportunity to speak about him tonight. And give us help, we would ask, not only for our words, but for the ears of the listeners as well. We do give thanks in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you again to all that are here, to all that are online. Thank you for listening and tuning in. I'm going to ask you to turn with me in your Bibles, please, to Matthew chapter 28. We're just going to make a quick stop by Matthew chapter 28. There's a word that we're going to pick up from Matthew chapter 28. The word is really on my mind is door. The door. So you can keep your fingers warmed up because we are just going to pass by Matthew chapter 28 quickly. Uh, look at Matthew 28 and verse number one. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. This is the tomb where they had put the Lord Jesus after he had been taken down from the cross. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning, his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. The angels answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, come see the place where the Lord lay or where the Lord had lain. And we're going to turn over now to John chapter 10, please. John chapter 10. So we just want you to remember what we read in Matthew chapter 28, the place where they had laid the Lord Jesus in that tomb. In that tomb, there was a door. We're going to read a few verses through John chapter 10. Look at verse number one. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Down to verse 7, and said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life. For the sheep over the verse 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. That's all that we're going to read. I'd likely refer to other scriptures. But I want to speak to you about the idea of the door. Uh, I was in the hospital recently, uh, visiting somebody else, and while I was visiting them on their unit, uh, I always I have a really poor sense of direction. Um, I had to travel here by myself. Uh, my wife wasn't with me, and I had to make two U-turns. I won't go into the details of what happened on those U-turns. But I did have to make two U-turns, uh, and that was with GPS on. Um, and when I go into one of those hospital units, I almost get a little anxious because there's all kinds of wings and different ways that you can go in that hospital. And so I always try to make a mental note of 
which way I've traveled and where the exit signs are. And so I went in, I, I did my visit, and then I was on the way out and I, I thought I knew where I was going. And I followed the sign that said exit and I walked and there was no door. So I walked back to the nurse's station and I said, I'm trying to leave and I can't find the door. They said, it's right down at the end of this hallway, just go straight, it's right here. So I walked down to the end of the hallway, couldn't see the door. And I was wondering what was going on. And all of a sudden this picture on a wall opened up and what they had done was to prevent the patients from leaving without authorization, they had painted a mural on the wall and the door and so that it looked like a big bookshelf. When we talk about, that, that's just a, just a homely illustration. When we talk about the door, we talk about the Lord Jesus. He says, I am the door. We often think about a door as the thing that swings on its hinges. Or metal that swings back and forth. But what we're actually looking for in the door is an opening. The gateway. It's an entrance. It's not something that blocks. It's not something you're not able to discern. Sometimes you're looking at a building, maybe from a distance, and you're trying to see where the door is, but you can't see where the door is. The door is closed. The opening, you can't see it. But what we actually have with the Lord Jesus when he says, I am the door, is it's an opening. It's a way in. If you want to look at it, it's a way out. The first thing I'd like to speak to you about is what we read and we touched in Matthew chapter 28 is this place that was the tomb and there was a door on the tomb. The Lord Jesus said here in John chapter 10, but he entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. If somebody else enters in a different way, he's a thief, he's a robber. But the shepherd has come in through the door. And there's two times in this chapter that we read about the door as imagery. In one time, we're reading the shepherd coming through the door. And then he says, I'm the shepherd and I'm the door. You see, the door that Jesus had to come through, the only way that God could provide a savior, the only way that somebody can offer salvation tonight, they had to come through the door. They had to go through death. They had to go through resurrection. They had to be lifted out of the tomb. Many people have gone to many different lengths to try to tell people that they can be their savior. Men have stood in place and said, I'm the one who can help you. I'm the one who can deliver you. I'm the one who can forgive your sins. I'm the one who's going to take this burden away. And I'm going to take this addiction. And many people have put themselves in the place of God, thinking that they're the ones who are able to deliver. But the problem is they haven't gone through the door. And they wouldn't be able to. There was only ever one who would be able to satisfy the requirements that God needed to be met. You see, there's only one who was fit to go to a cross. There's only one. Oh, many people died on the cross, but there was only one man who was fit to be there for other people. The people that ended up on the cross, even people that were wrongly accused. We know with the Lord Jesus that the people that were on the cross with him, there were three people crucified that day. And those two others, the thieves on either side, they were guilty. And they said, we've done these things, but this we've received our reward for our deeds justly. But this man has done nothing to miss. But even when people are put to death, even when people were crucified on those crosses and they were innocent of the charges that were being brought about against them by the Roman government, even they were guilty of breaking the law of God. Every person who suffers death is simply paying the wages that sin requires. The wages of sin is death. And so there's not one single person born since Adam who would able to be able to go to a cross, to be able to go into death and enter death and say, I'm going here on the behalf of someone else. Because the only way somebody could do that is they had to have no sin to answer for themselves. And so we find with the Lord Jesus, one who stands completely pure, completely sinless, nothing against him, no sin by man could be brought against him. They had to bring false witnesses to try to accuse him. Nobody could find any fault in him. Pilate examined him. I'm sure Pilate had never seen a man like that before. Never seen somebody go through scrutiny and such scourging and never admit to something, never confess 
confess to something. Not only did he not have anything to confess to, but no words of hatred, no words of anger came out of his mouth. Here was a man that was completely pure. There was no guile in his mouth. Even when he suffered, he didn't make any kind of threats. What a man he is. And this is the man with absolutely no sin. And God in heaven looks down. Man has said, we find no fault in him. The Lord Jesus looks at his own life. He says, who here can convince me of sin? He, in his own examination of his own life, could find nothing wrong. And he says, I don't just speak of myself. I have others who bear witness of me. And then the Father in heaven opens up heaven itself and declares, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. There's only one who would be fit to go to the cross, and that is the Lord Jesus. And so this man, the Lord Jesus Christ, after having come down from heaven, after, after having lived here, having proved who he was, the Messiah, the Savior, he goes through to the cross. And there he dies for our sins. Why else would he have died? Why else would God have allowed him to die? There was nothing that he could have died for. He had no sin. So death had nothing to hold on him. No death could have encountered him. But God was able to judge him for our sin. And because he took our sin, because he took my sin and your sin, God was able to judge him for our sin. And he died on the cross. The only one who could be the Savior. The only one who could go through this storm. But it wasn't enough. I want you to listen very carefully. What the Lord Jesus did on the cross proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that he loves us. The suffering that he was willing to go through proves that he loves us. You can't read about the Lord Jesus. You can't read about what he did and say, oh, that man didn't love me. But it wasn't enough that he died on the cross. It wasn't enough, was it? You see, there was a door that he had to go through. And when that tomb opened up, and those people, even the people that knew him, were expecting to find him there. But he had gone through that door. God had raised him from the dead. In the power of his own life, now an endless life, never to suffer for sin, never to answer for sin again. He's gone through the door of resurrection, proving not only that he loves us, not only that he's answered for sin, but that he is able to give us life, to remove our sin from us and to give us that life that he talks about here that is so abundant. And we find now this shepherd who has entered in, all those others that have tried are thieves and robbers and only take people down further and remove things from them and add burdens to them. And maybe you've tried things in your own life. Before I was saved, I know I tried. I tried to satisfy myself. Never to find satisfaction. Where have you found satisfaction? If you were a sinner who had found satisfaction somewhere else, you would not be here tonight. I would say just proof positive that you're here is that you haven't found satisfaction. You're looking for something. But you're not going to find what you need until you are willing to face your own sin and the fact that the Lord Jesus is the Savior. He's the only one that can satisfy You see, all the other ones out there, even the things that we try to do ourselves, we're simply trying to take the place of the shepherd. And we can't fill those shoes. They're too big. It's a work that's already been done. and It's a work that we can't do. It's not, it's not something that we need to try. He has done it. He has done it. He has been raised from the dead. He has conquered death. He now offers salvation. We can't do that for ourselves, and nobody else can offer that. I'm thinking of a story, and maybe you've heard that before. There was a, oh, uh, excuse me, a woman who was lying in a bed. And somebody came in and had the white collar on, and they said, I'm here to forgive you your sins. She said, well, can I please see your hands? And she, and the, the man held out his hands, and she looked at his hands. Oh, those are the wrong hands. The hands of the man that can forgive sin have to have nail marks in them. You see, he's the only one that can do that. But now we have a, sh a shepherd, this good shepherd, who is the one who gives his life for the sheep. We have this good shepherd who has come through the door, 
He's come through the door of resurrection to prove himself to be the shepherd. And now he sets as the door itself. And here are the sheep. And prior to that, they're stuck in the pasture. They're stuck in this place. They can't get through to the green grass. They can't get through to the place where life is more abundant, where life is more satisfying. They can't get through there. But now the door is open. Now the gate is there. Now there's an entrance into that life. And he's provided it for all, for any of the sheep that would hear his voice and simply follow him through. There's salvation for everyone. And the only ones that don't enjoy it are the ones who stay back. I'm not sure why a sinner stays back. I know in my own experience, I was proud. I wanted to figure it out myself. I wanted to find something. I wanted to be able to claim, yes, I found this and now I've got salvation. I figured out the formula and now I'm saved. But people stay back for all kinds of reasons. People stay back and they say, I just want, I want to examine this a little bit more closely. You don't need to examine it more closely. God has already proved that it's the gate to go through because he raised Jesus from the dead. Where are you going to find somebody or anything that matches that? Where are you going to find forgiveness of sins? And people stay on the wrong side of the door and they look through the gate and maybe you're even able to see some of the things that are on the other side and some of those wonders that God has provided. And maybe you can see some of the sheep that have passed through the door and they're enjoying that life that's more abundant. And yet you're staying here on the other side. And the whole time the shepherd who gave his life, who bears the marks of Calvary, is just waiting. He's calling, compelling you to come to enter through the door that he's provided. You see, it's a life for these sheep. If you look not only in verse 9, that he's the door and that he offers salvation, because not only is it a way into life, into life that's more abundant, but the place that we stay beforehand, for all the sheep that don't go through the door, it's a place of death. It's a place of condemnation. It's a place of sin. It's a place of darkness. God can't accept them. And for the sheep that stay there, God can't accept them because they're marred by sin. They need to be obedient to the shepherd. They need to listen to the gospel message. You need to listen and obey God. God has commanded that you believe the gospel. It's not just a shepherd that's compelling, but God has commanded all men everywhere to repent. It's not an option. And for those that stay on the wrong side of the open gate, that is condemnation and disobedience. God has to judge sin. God is holy. We suffer the consequences of sin in this life, but judgment for sin doesn't begin until life ends. So not only is it salvation and the enjoyment of life that's more abundant, we read about that, a life that is more abundant in verse 10, but it is salvation in verse 10. It's salvation from something. It's deliverance from danger. But I want you to notice just as I close and leave room for my brother. Look over at verse number 27. I'm going to read through these verses again. My sheep hear my pluck them out of my hand. I want you to think for a moment if you've ever if you've ever heard the parable in Luke chapter 15. And there is the lost sheep. And the shepherd goes until he finds it. And he picks up that sheep and he puts it on his shoulders. And he carries it back to his home. This is the picture that we have here in the shepherd. The sheep is safe. There's nothing that can touch it. The shepherd's not going to drop it on the way back. He's going to see it safe all the way through. He saves to the uttermost. There's nothing that can happen. There's absolute security for those that are willing to trust, those, those that are willing to enter through the door, to obey the gospel. There's nothing that can come. No person can come. No enemy can come. There's nothing that I can do myself. And God himself cannot remove me from the security that I have in Jesus Christ. That is a good shepherd. That is the life that God gives. That is the salvation that is being offered. This is the gate that the Lord Jesus opened. It was a door that would have been closed otherwise. Again, I would ask you, just in your own mind, look through life, look through your own experience, look through the experiences of others. I would think of a, a man that I 
heard recently, and he was talking about his experience in Hollywood. And he's achieved success. He's not a A-ranked actor, but he's pretty high, well-known. People recognize his face. And he said, nobody told me as I was climbing the ladder of success at Hollywood that when I got to the top, there was nothing there. Nothing there. You look at the experiences of other people. Please open the word of God and look at the experiences that are recorded for us. There's no other way. There's no other satisfaction. But there is satisfaction in the Lord Jesus. So we would compel. We can't command you, but we can compel you. We can beseech you on behalf of Christ. Believe in the Lord Jesus. Go through the gate. If you don't know the Savior, trust him. You can trust him. He's trustworthy. We heard that this morning. You'll find not only is that burden of sin removed, but you'll actually just start to live. I trusted the Lord Jesus when I was 23. I thought I was alive up until I was 23. Oh, that's when life just began. He did something that I could never do for myself, that nobody could ever help me. He'll do the same for you. You know what it is? One of the things. He gives you life. He gives you eternal life, life that will never end, life that can't be taken away, life that even death here on this earth can't stop. We just continue on. I, I would ask somebody to do this. This is just a challenge. I, I, I've thought about this myself. Change your desire. You do that. You change your desire. You can stop a behavior. You change your desire. You can't do that. But he can. And those things that seem like such a burden, those chains that are so heavy, and that I can't break. And that I can't make them go away. He's a savior. He delivers from those things. Trust the savior today. And find a life that's more abundant. It's a pleasure to be with you. Trust that God will bless his word as it has been spoken and as we'll attempt to pass on a message from the scriptures. I want to read from the book of Isaiah, <clears throat> please. Isaiah chapter 53. <clears throat> I trust you will find it in your heart to forgive my poor abilities at being able to articulate the words that I want to proclaim. Uh, I had COVID about 60 days ago, and, uh, well, it wasn't nice. And uh, I'm just now getting my voice back. So I'm very thankful for that. It's been awful not being able to sing because uh, I enjoy being able to sing for the Savior. Isaiah 53, please. And let's read at verse 6. Isaiah 53. And verse 6, all we like sheep. <laughs> I remember reading this text in a series of gospel meetings in the city of Toronto. There was a man who had come to a number of them. And the night that I was speaking about this text, he said, under his breath, more or less, sheep. He says, sheep, what's that got to do with it? Well, I think that you'll find if you look at this text, it has a great deal to do with it. Because God proclaims this truth to us. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. I'm going to read that text again. It isn't that I think you're not a good listener. But I want to focus your attention simply on the words of this text. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. You know, there's probably in this province of Canada more sheep than any of us could ever count. Because the Bible talks about you and me like sheep who have gone astray. I was uh, a number of years ago in the city of Jackson, Michigan, 
And uh, I met a couple of young folks there that were four years old and two years old at the time. And uh, I heard a story about them. They'd gone with their parents to a Myers store, which is an enormous thing, acres and acres of deals. At least that's what they proclaimed. And uh, they had gone along with their parents and their parents took them to a special section of that store that was set aside for, well, your children to go. And while their parents were shopping, entertain themselves. I don't think you want to do it now, but back then it seemed a safer world. And these two young people were left in this area at four years old and two years old. They were told very plainly, this is where you're to be and we're going to go and shop. And they went shopping. And I suppose it turned into quite an event because they shopped a long time. And all of a sudden over the long loudspeaker system, there was a message from the front desk that said, would Mr. and Mrs. Wheelinga please come to the front desk? There's a little girl here who's lost. And when they heard that, they could scarcely believe it. And they hurried to the front desk. And there was Beth, four years old, crying her eyes out. But her brother, it was two. He wasn't there. And he wasn't where he was supposed to be either. But both of them had wandered away. And they looked high and low through that store. Their hearts sounded just pounding within as they searched for Paul. Finally, they found him. He wasn't crying. He was in the toil. And stuff down off his shelves. He was tearing up and down the aisle. And he was having a wonderful time. And do you know why he wasn't crying? Do you know why he wasn't upset? He didn't know he was lost. And perhaps I'm speaking to someone here tonight. You're almost offended by the thought that you could get lost. Or be lost. But the Bible says all we like sheep have gone astray. It doesn't say we might. It says we've done it. All we like sheep have gone astray. We all know that sheep tend to follow others. We've all heard the story. Well, there was a hole in the fence. Well, you can be sure that if one goes through, the rest will follow. But you know, that's not the only characteristic of sheep. And I think some of you understand that well, you've probably seen the sheep in the field. How white were they? Oftentimes they're anything. But they become dirty. That's one of the problems with the sinners. It becomes dirty and sin. Are they aware of it? Do they consciously seek some place of cleansing? No. They're quite content the way they are. And sadly today, as I speak about the lost, oftentimes we find that those that the Bible is describing here as having gone our own way, as taking our own path in life of going astray, most of the time they're not alarmed about it. In spite of the fact, it's true. All, without exception. All, no matter what we may think of ourselves, all we like sheep have gone astray. There's another feature about sheep. I'm not going to tell you all the features that I know. I can tell you one. Because maybe it relates to someone here. And I hope you won't be offended by it. I think it does relate to some in the audience who have heard the gospel time and time again and have never come to know the Savior. You know what it is? Sheep like to get up high. And they like to look down on the other sheep. And how often we have found, as we speak with people who want, it seems, at least on the surface, to be saved, that they've spent a lot of time looking at others. And as they look down on them, oftentimes, it affects their thinking that 
they are sure they've never done the things that others have done. They've never gone so far astray. They've never become so defiled. They've never wandered so that they're in danger of losing their souls for eternity. Sadly, the lost are oftentimes unaware of it. And just like little Paul will hear, who is lost, they don't know it. Am I speaking to someone tonight? And you've come along to gospel meetings like this. Maybe you've heard a personal testimony of someone who's a believer in the Lord Jesus. And because of their love or their care for your soul, they've tried to tell you about Christ and how you can be saved for all eternity. And you're still wandering, still in your sin. Each day, in spite of what you think, getting further and further and still further from God, all we, like sheep, have gone astray. Not only do we see in this text the loss, but look at it. It speaks about the awful lament. He says, iniquity, the iniquity of us all. You know, here's a person, as he tells us in the scriptures, this thought about the sheep having gone astray. What comes to mind as they've strayed is the iniquity. Now, maybe you'd like to just equate that to sin. And it does equate to sin. But it seems to me that as I read about iniquity in the scriptures, what I find is that the thought of iniquity, it emphasizes the darker, deeper, awful, Dimension of our sin. You know, maybe you're saying, well, why would that be? Because iniquity pictures someone who takes the good things that God has given them and twisted them, thinking perhaps life has been good to me. And I'm not responsible to anyone. And my sin's not so bad. And sometimes like Adam, why we've been blessed so much. And yet we take things in our own hand. And we listen as eager to the words of the evil one. And we're caught up in the trap of iniquity. That twisted nature that takes the good things that God gives us, the blessings that he's heaped upon us in our lives, and we've taken them for granted, and we haven't been thankful. Oh, the iniquity he speaks of here, and it even affects how we think of God. Yes. He doesn't care. It really doesn't matter that much. God's preserving this far. Maybe I can get away with my sin another day. The twisted nature of our sin, iniquity. Oh, the awful lament, the awful cry, when a soul sees how vile they are in the eyes of God, forgetting his mercy and his kindness. Oh, turning aside from acknowledging him as your God, your Lord, your Savior. Twisting the good things God has provided in such grace into a soul that is unresponsive to him in spite of all his kindness towards us. I want you to think thirdly, of the Lord. We've spoken about the, the lost. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. Do you find yourself admitting that? My mother wasn't saved until she was 73 years of age. We used to give her one of those joyful news calendars 
at uh, Christmas time, usually for the next year. I don't know why it was we forgot one year, but we forgot to give it to her. And uh, I remember her saying, do you have one? Sure, we got it, gave it to her. They put it up in their wall. My mother had probably a grade four education, um, not very well educated. And yet they got to the month, I think it was March, and there on the calendar was a picture of one sheep in a field. Oh, and for some reason, what reason? I don't know, unless it was just God focused in their attention on it. They wanted to know why that sheep was there in that field all along. And they looked at it and they actually learned the verse. All oh, we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of his fall. That fall, we had gospel meetings in our area. My mother and her husband came along. And for the first time in her life, it made sense to her that she was the one who had gone astray, that she had taken God's good things and twisted them around for her own pleasure. And according to her design and for her own purposes, and finally recognized through the truth of that verse that they were attracted to an account. That the Lord laid on him the sin, the iniquity of us all. I want you to think just for a moment about the load, the load of sin, the awful guilt we had racked up against God. Those many iniquities, those frequent transgressions, the ways that we had taken our ungrateful hearts all exposed to the God of glory, all calling for judgment from on high. And God took the load of our sin and all its great mass of debt. And it tells us he has laid it, he has laid it on his son. It says he hath laid on him the iniquity of his all. Never stop and think about the Lord that the Savior born. He came into the world and loved the souls of men. He went to a cross and there he suffered such anguish. We sometimes sing, Oh Christ, what burdens bowed thy head? Our Lord was laid on thee. Thou stoodest in the sinner's stead. There is all my ill for me. How wonderful it is when the guilty soul sees their Lord placed on him, knowing that what he did there at the cross was sufficient to meet all my need for all eternity, to see my Lord and all its consequences laid on Christ the Savior who died for us. Oh, Christ, what burdens bow the hand. Oh, the awful load was his to bear alone. Look to the cross. What happened there? I am sure that from the scriptures, those in my audience tonight understand, you know what happened, that it was there. Christ died for our sins. That it was there in the language of Paul, the Son of God, loved me, gave himself for me. To think that Christ died for our sins, that he was the one who went there, taking our place in our judgment and our wrath. And oh, the Lord, who could measure it? Who could count it up? Who could possibly understand it? What it was for him, the Holy One, to die in our place. Well, here's the good news. God doesn't ask you to understand. God tells you in plain language that that load of your guilt, your shame, your sin, 
he laid it on his son. And Jesus bore it all. Those of us who are saved say, everything I deserved, he endured. All the load that should have been mine, he bore it in love and love. What none could know. And listen to this. He passed through death and gloriously confounded our every foe. The one who died is not dead and laid in a grave. The one who died is alive today. And the good news is this, that he's able to save you to the uttermost if you come to him. But that's where it really comes down to your responsibility. He's done all the work. God laid it on him. But the scripture says he is able to save them to the uttermost. They come unto God by him. Just give a moment and think back. Was there ever a moment, ever a time? When you came in all your guilty need, threw yourself upon his mercy, knowing his unfailing love could embrace you, knowing his work was sufficient, knowing what he did was enough. I don't know what you see in this text of mine. I see the lost, all oh, the sad cry. You know, you hear about people wandering off, little children. I remember two little boys, twins, just two years old, wandering away, lost, and sadly too, not only were they lost, they were swept in the current of a spring stream to death. It brings on great heart-moving concerns, doesn't it, when you hear they're lost. Some have lost things of great value. Lost. But to lose your soul is such a great loss. No one, no one, not even God can restore. Lost. And sadly, so many in our world tonight going on thinking all is well. They don't know. They're lost. Not only is there the loss, but the lament because of the recognition of our guilt and sin. And all the load that we should have borne. Thank God the Savior bore it in love and love. But think with me of the love that this message mentions. You see, it says it was for us all. God so loved us all that he gave his only begotten son so that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And friend, tonight, as I close, I want you to know, I hope you'll take it in, that his love goes on, even now, to this very moment. And should you even make the awful choice that rather than come, you turn away I want you to know he loved you. And he made it very clear on a cross of shame. And today he lives able to deliver. Why won't you come? You're going to twist God's grace again. Say, well, some other time, friend, you've heard enough. 
We have denied his law, the place it deserves in your life. Say, God might have loved the world, but that's not good enough for me. Oh, the solemn reality that in spite of the love of God, you can be lost forevermore. Did God write the truth of it and the seriousness of it on your heart tonight? All we like sheep, we've gone astray. We have turned time and again to our own way. But the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all, making, as we've been hearing, the way plain, the entrance to God's salvation clear, and tonight is available to you. Tell me what we do with Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we bow, so thankful for our Savior's love. Such a marvel to think that he loved us. He knew us as individuals. Every one of us known to God. He calls us in his grace. Every one of us is called to come. And yet tonight, so many still stalling. Still making excuses. Still not convinced that should they miss it, they will be lost forevermore. We ask your blessing, giving thanks now in the precious name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Let's sing a couple of verses, please, of number 24. Number 24. Come.